Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 35th edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Uh, my name is Mark Tobin. For anybody who's joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. And for all our kind of regulars, which I know there are a few that have registered, um, welcome to, to this morning's event and welcome back and thank you for your support. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through these uh, opening slides and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. So for anybody joining us for the first time, um, companies you'll expect to see in the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting are companies with a market cap of under 300 million, uh, businesses that are in revenue, you know, approaching cash flow break even or indeed already profitable. Uh, we don't focus on companies in the junior resource, junior mining space, nor do we focus on kind of biotechnology uh, companies either. So it's a kind of a catch-all term for industrial microcaps. So for anybody who's wondering, you know, what coffee microcaps is about, that's what we kind of tend to shine a light on. Um, the structure of the webinar for this morning, as is every uh, week, uh, we got two companies presenting. Uh, it's a 30 minute slot for each company broken down into a 20 minute prezzo and we 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. If you do have questions, please type them in the, in the Q&A box um, in the nav bar rather than the chat function. It just makes it easier for me to moderate the questions at the end. Uh, please note the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel um, tomorrow morning around nine, half past nine. So, you know, if we skip over a slide um, particularly quick or you can't hang around for the full presentation, but you want to catch the last 10 minutes or whatever, you can just watch it back um, tomorrow. You can follow Coffee Microcaps. Uh, Twitter's our kind of main social channel. As I said, YouTube for uh, the recording of this webinar and all our previous events, LinkedIn. And I also write a weekly paid subscription newsletter or I profile one interesting microcap stock every week, and you can get that on this Substack newsletter platform. Uh, up first, we've got uh, Justin Pettit, non-executive chairman of Locality Planning Energy Holdings, who's going to be joining us now in one minute. And then after Justin, we're welcoming back, actually, Dr. Chris Richards, MD of APM Animal Health. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to hand over to Justin. So, yeah, you're coming up now, Justin. Yeah, I can see your presentation now, Justin. You're good to go. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Mark, for having us on. And hello, everyone. Um, as Mark said, I'm the chairman of uh, LPE. I'll just, uh, we've got our disclaimer slide here. Um, so LP, what do we what do we do? So we're an electricity provider, and we specialise in renewable generation solutions using um, shared solar, battery, centralised hot water, um, primarily to give strata communities not only a, a, a reduction on their electricity costs, but assist them to to access um, a cleaner, greener uh, electricity or energy sources. We're also a um, traditional electricity supplier to homes and businesses and, and communities throughout um, uh, Queensland and, and New South Wales. Our authority enables us to go further, but we just um, have enough to do in those areas. We first became an, an authorised retailer back in, in 2014, listed on the ASX in 2016. And our vision really is to empower people to save money and create sustainable communities of the future. So uh, our shared solar product, we started in embedded networks, which I'll, I'll talk to, but our shared solar product um, is really achieving that vision for us. Just to go through the, the, the main products that we supply, embedded networks, um, that's what we cut our teeth on. Uh, around 60% of our 40,000 customers now are contracted and a lot of those, if not most of them, are in embedded networks. And what that is, is we take an apartment block and instead of each apartment facing the meter and having their own electricity account and paying their own network charges, we uh, aggregate all of those meters together and we put what we call a parent meter or a main meter in front of all those, um, all those apartments. And that one meter faces the, the grid and pays one business network charge. 
and then we distribute that um, that network saving through to all of the apartments in the building, which will um, which will result in a quite a substantial saving on on electricity costs for a lot of the cus customers within that embedded network. We treat everyone within an embedded network as if they're connected to the grid, so they get you know all of our um, if they're having trouble with debt, we are able to help them there, but we bill each one individually, so. There's no difference um, from a customer standpoint, except they save money, we're able to make a margin, and we can also recover the capital that, um, that we've spent to create that embedded network. So LPE is really recognised as one of the largest um, residential embedded network operators in Southeast Queensland. Now we have a quite a big footprint in this area and have been um, very successful at um, getting customers. Shared solar is our latest product that we've been working on. Um, admittedly, we had a few hiccups with the network providers um, because uh, SolShare, which is a diverter that we use that's actually designed and built by Alum Energy in Melbourne. So this is an Australian made and produced um, diverter. And what that does is we take uh, the roof space of a, a strata community and we put a large um, building scale solar um, panel array on top of that building. And then the solar energy is sold in real time during the day to customers um, through the Alum SolShare uh, diverter in, in real time. So the diverter will divert the energy to, if one apartment is just running a light and a fridge, they'll get a little bit of energy. But if another apartment is using a, a lot of electricity at the time, they'll get more of the solar electricity during the day. So it's a it's a great um, it's a great diverter and a great tool to have um, uh, for this application. Uh, LP have an exclusive rights um, to the uh, SolShare, so it's something that's really going to help us grow the company and grow our footprint um, through shared solar with our strata communities moving forward. So. From a customer, again, from a customer perspective, they're able to achieve a saving. Or not only can they access um, uh, renewable energy, but they can achieve a, a, small, a small saving on the already um, low LP grid price that they, they pay. So it's a win for customers and it's a win for us as the company. Again, we're deploying assets, we're, we're locking, um, and we do that for no upfront cost or zero cost and we recover that capital over a 15 year term. So again, body corporates, they love it. They love the, the, um, the system because we put it in for, for no cost and they on their bill, they have a line item that says solar energy and, and that's a different price obviously than their grid energy and, and everyone's happy. So this is, this is a big product that we're primarily moving forward with throughout the next financial year. Centralised hot water is, is also a really big part of, of what we do. And we find centralised hot waters in apartments and, and other, other buildings, that strata buildings. So again, we're using solar panels to heat the hot water. So a lot of the time the hot water is not even heated from the grid and that's why we can call it carbon neutral hot water mm -hmm. in that, again, we pay for the, um, the physical assets or the generation assets to then heat the water and we then bill customers and on, again on the same bill. So they might have shared solar and might be buying grid electricity from us as well. And then we bill them hot water by the leader. So again, we're able to make um, a margin there and the customer doesn't have to go through the, the cost of heating the hot water, nor the, the cost, the upfront cost to purchasing the cylinders. So again, this is a, a very popular product. And as I said, um, retail electricity, um, how homes, businesses, um, we supply all their day-to-day -day electricity needs. And, um, and our, we've just recently passed 40,000 customers and, and we're really, really happy um, with that. But admittedly, we're, we're very focused on, on 50,000 now. So once you hit a, a milestone, you, 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 it's amazing how you, you, you move that focus straight to the next milestone. Some of the highlights um, with regards to, you know, what makes us different to, to any other um, providers is that a lot of our customers or the majority of our customers are contracted. So um, what that means is if they're in an embedded network, they're contracted for up to 10 years. If it's shared solar, uh, they're contracted up to 15 years. So there has to be a benefit for the customer. You know, they, they, have, to, they have to want the product and there's got to be a benefit, which in both instances there are, whether it's saving money on their electricity 
or accessing um, solar electricity, which um, a lot of people living in strata communities before now have really not had the opportunity to do that. So shared solar is really a game changer for strata communities and businesses and, and behind the meter generation. And again, we don't want any excess energy or as little as possible going into the grid because it means we've just got to buy it back with the high network charges. So we prefer to have our, um, uh, our solar electricity go into uh, heating hot water or going into batteries that are discharged at night. A little bit about our growth. Um, uh, customer growth has been really good year on year. Um, and we're also on target to hit our 10,000 customers for this year. I know we only have two weeks left, so thus I'm pretty confident about hitting that target. And um, we look forward to reporting that next month. So yeah, growth has been 30% year on year, which is, which is great. And we hope it continues or we're planning for it to continue as has revenue growth has been quite strong. Again, 30% year on year. Um, this is showing the half year revenues, which is the last time we reported to the market. And I can say full year revenues are, are looking quite good and um, should fall into line. And we look forward to reporting that uh, very soon. Just some of the, the key financial highlights. So over time, uh, the company has grown really aggressively, customers and, and revenue wise. And admittedly, uh, uh, last couple of years, um, before the last couple of years, costs have, have gotten up. So uh, last 18 months, we've really focused on bringing our costs down, increasing our efficiency. And, and this is the result. You can see customers and revenues growing by 30% but our operating expenditure only, you know, growing at 7%. So by comparison, we've really got a handle on that, um, on those operating costs. We had our, our first small uh, profit in our half year, um, which was great. And I think that's, um, you know, that should, to all investors, should be a sign of, uh, of the effort that's going on in the background. And when we bring out our end of year, our June 21 financials, um, the result there that you see should be a reflection of the effort that's going on in the background also. So again, we're, we're really happy with how things are, are tracking financially. As far as our, our growth strategy moving forward, it really is um, on our exclusive shared solar in Strata. So, um, and the way, you know, as I said, the way that works is, is customers just pay a, a flat solar usage rate for electricity generated. And, and this, this rate, um, this covers capital costs and also supplies an additional margin to, to LPE, but at the same time, saving the customer money on their electricity. So we aim for a gross profit of around 20% or more than 20% overall within the, cup, um, the company, and that's separate, separate to capital recovery. And, you know, we can, um, and we do that by delivering savings to the customer. And I just with shared solar, I want to use a bit of an example because I, I, investors need to know what the numbers are going into the background. If I take a typical residential uh, customer who's in an apartment and they're using 3,600 kilowatts per annum, so they're not big users of electricity. So we're talking nine to 10, 11 kilowatts um, a day on average. Yeah, we as a grid connected customer, uh, when they're connected with us, we, um, you know, we make around 16% uh, gross profit or around $150 a year from the customer. So, you know, this business is, a, is, is somewhat a low margin and a high volume business. So the, the challenge for us or the opportunity for us is how do we increase that, that margin, but at the same time deliver a, a benefit for our customer. And we've been able to do that through shared solar. So shared for that same customer, shared solar will increase the GP to around $250 a year. And that's around 22%. And at the same time, we're saving that customer money on their electricity, plus they're accessing um, a solar or renewable electricity. So that, that's an example. Like we've got many customer types and they, they all use electricity differently. So, but for this example, you know, whilst it's not typical, I just wanted to give a bit of an idea because we have businesses in strata communities as well that um, are high users of electricity and, and they're also accessing um, shared solar. So, so moving forward, not only will shared solar make us more profitable, 
but it's also getting a lot of airplay in the media and the market. So there's, you'll start to see a lot of, um, a lot of articles written about it because it, it's the shared solar is really a, a, a product for, uh, that's tailor-made for strata communities. Of course, we're going to continue and we do continue to um, add embedded network customers. So I think in the last two months, we've had close to a thousand come over whether it be a, a takeover of an existing embedded network where there's a billing agent involved and the body corporate don't want to take the risk on any debts or, or managing that anymore, or it's working with developers on, um, on, on putting an embedded network in their buildings or centralized hot water. Or the other one is a retrofitting, which we've been very successful at and has been the majority of our our growth in the early days was, was taking an existing building and, and turning it into an embedded network. And of course, we're, we're always, because we can do it, we, we're always taking on our retail customers. And, you know, we have 6,000 customers a year alone move out of our embedded network um, buildings. So we want to make sure we've got a product for those customers that come out of an apartment building, move into a house, we still want them to enjoy the, the service from LPE. So, you know, if we can capture 50% of those customers because they haven't moved to a different state that we don't supply in, then that's 3,000 customers a year just moving out of our embedded network. So if the customer has a great experience within the buildings that we service, they want to continue that, that service outside the building. So um, we're able to offer that. And also being a, an energy retailer too, we can we can create products that are very soft touch to customers. So there's no, there's no line item saying a capital recovery cost or anything like that. It's just a one flat solar usage rate that we can uh, recover our capital and make a margin. And of course, residential solar and batteries, we, 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 we install, supply and install uh, residential solar and batteries. Um, we do cash sales. We're looking at financing options for that now. So we offer um, everything. So we, we really have a renewable base moving forward. As far as the market opportunity in, in strata communities, it's, it's huge. We've, we've barely scratched the surface and yet we're one of the largest providers in Southeast Queensland. So in, in Queensland alone, there, there's around 46,000 schemes or strata communities and you know, around 470,000 customers there that we can go and talk to about shared solar and embedded networks. Um, similar to in uh, New South Wales, a lot more schemes, a lot more customers. And again, you know, the, the electricity market in general in, in Australia is, um, is huge. And just in Queensland and New South Wales is massive. So we've got a really big pond to swim in. As far as our, our capital structure, uh, this is what we, we look like at the moment. So market cap of only $11 million. So, um, you know, it's, it's uh, we're, we're, we're I'm sure when everyone sees the financial results of this year, they'll uh, be gobsmacked. But uh, I think it's important to, to show you know, the main shareholders, Damien and myself, uh, who founded the company, uh, are two of the largest shareholders in the company. So it's um, pretty tightly held the, the stock and doesn't take much uh, trading either way to move the, move the share price around. Management team and board, uh, the company is run by Damien and, and he does a fantastic job. Uh, Mel, our CFO, yeah, Damien and Mel, we, we pretty much can't live without. Those guys are, are great. And it's my job to um, support them and their management teams uh, through this growth. And as I said, as the financial results start to come out, that will be an indication of how things have gone, uh, particularly over the last 18 months. And Mark, that's uh, that's all. Uh, that's the last slide. So, um, if there's any questions, I'm I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, we've got a, a few questions, Justin. So let me uh, try and rattle through them. Um, okay, do, here's one now uh, with a lot of acronyms that I'm are presuming are related to the uh, energy market. Are there plans to make the batteries grid facing to access? lucrative ancillary markets such as RERT, FCAS and WDRM. I'm hoping you know that uh, those acronyms, Justin. Yep, yep. So the batteries can be, the, a lot of the batteries or the batteries are, can be controlled. Um, and yes, we will, um, 
our plans on the bigger batteries is to have them grid facing for FCAS in particular. So um, yeah, whilst it's lucrative, it's just like our, our, our derivative strategy on how we purchase um, electricity from the wholesale market. We don't trade, our, our philosophy is to preserve margin. And so we are very conservative in the way that we um, go about our hedging strategy. And, and this is a, probably an example. I know the market, those markets can be lucrative, but when, it's not a focus of ours. Um, so yeah, whilst we will look to um, have some of the batteries face the market directly, it's not a focus to make money out of, of helping with, you know, with FCAS and things like that. So um, yeah, we're really focused on what we can do behind the, the meter and, and not touch the grid at all. And then another one, um, can a loom scale their manufacturing to meet um, LP's demand? Yes, so in our exclusivity agreement with them, we've together worked on a ramp up. So, and that ramp up starts next month in July. So um, it's very clear from our side and their side, um, what the numbers need to, what they need to achieve month on month and what we need to deliver month on month. So yeah, we've worked, it's not an instant, you know, 100 a, day, 100 a month, it's a, it's a scale up for sure. And um, yeah, and, and that works really well for, for everybody. Okay. Um, of the, the for the embedded networks now, um, just for the you know when you get into a Strata, for example, and you um put in the embedded network, you know what proportion of those um units would then take LP as their retailer, uh, energy retailer uh, versus you know their kind of existing retailer. Yeah, um, it's not enough at the moment. It's something that we're we're really working hard on on building, and we are building. You know, it's around ten percent at the moment, and it's growing. And a lot of that is a lot of customers will move um, to a different location, um, or they'll move in. A lot of we're seeing a lot of people move back in with family. So at the moment, so which are who are already connected to the to the grid now. Our sales people are, are very good at trying to get that customer on board. But um, yeah, we want to get to 50%. That's our target internally um, out of those 6,000 customers. And, and we're working hard on, on building that. Okay. Um, where Can you give us an update on where you are in terms of uh, New South Wales regulatory approval for, for solid share? Yeah. Um, uh, we're almost there, I would say in the next month or two, um, we'll be there with um, Endeavour and Essential. So they're two network providers in, in New South Wales. Um, so, and yeah, there's, there's a lot to do down in New South Wales. So we're, we're very keen to get them across the line. It, we don't expect an issue there at all because Energex or Energy Queensland are across the line already. So once you've introduced a new product into one network service provider, um, the others pretty much fall in line. So um, we don't anticipate an issue there. Okay. And then what's your usual sales pitch to, you know, why these Straha management companies are, you know, the, I guess the, the board uh, of trustees of that strata, you know, the, the residents who kind of run it, even though they might have a, an appointed uh, kind of day-to-day -day operations manager, you know, to, to win them across as a customer, is it purely giving them the cost benefit uh, savings that they're going to make? Is that is that mainly what gets them across the line or? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's, uh, it's a lot of things. It's not just cost the cost benefit. Um, so strata managers, and I, I think um, I, I'm, I'm hearing the question right, you have strata managers that manage all of the body corporates because the body corporates are made up all of, of owners. And it's really the body corporate that we, we try and target. So we want to try and target, or we do target the end users. Uh, yeah, we, we have many, many relationships with strata managers but it's really getting to the body corporates and, and explaining to them the, the benefits of an embedded network, for example, um, the benefits and, and the savings and, and more so the service that we provide because we are a specialist strata uh, provider. So we understand 
all of the, the hoops they have to jump through in order to call in meetings. We help body corporates call meetings. We supply templates and, and we make it as, as seamless as possible. And particularly with body corporates and strata managers, um, we, you have to over-service them. You, you have to touch them uh, regularly and that's what we do. So um, it, it's, it's an area that has been overlooked for a long time. And, and it's an area that we're, we are over-servicing and, and being really successful at it. So again, you know, going shared solar at the moment, I had a question the other day, you know, what are the, what are the objections you get to shared solar? And we haven't, there are, you try and think about what are the objections? I'm gonna put solar on your roof that'll generate um, electricity during the day and sell it to you at a price lower than you can pay directly to the grid. So, um, and it's not going to cost any more. And, and a lot of people are happy to pay more to access renewable energy, but because a lot of other retailers will charge you more to access green energy on your bill, but not with us. So we're, we're certainly, we want the customer to have uh, generate saving, have a good experience and, um, and, and you know, generally there's no objection. It's just a process. Um, another one then, um, is a declining long run wholesale electricity price generally positive for gross margins for LPE or how does, I guess you have variations in the wholesale electricity price affect your margins? No, so, so we've gone through uh, a period of time and, and except for the last couple of weeks um, where wholesale electricity has been the lowest ever you know it's it's totally out of whack and particularly with covid um you know you, you've seen everyone should see in their in what they're paying for electricity their prices have come down but we've got to keep into perspective that um it's not wholesale electricity like if our flat rate is 16 and a half cents per kilowatt plus gst um five, six six cents of that 16 cents is energy the other 10 to 11 cents are network charges, environmental charges that every retailer pays to the, uh, the, the network. And, and so it's really getting around, a way getting around the network, network charges like we have with our shared solar that will generate our margin to then, um, to then produce a saving for the customer, but also recover our capital. And our view is if we can make it work in this market, we can make it work in any market because honestly, the energy rates have been l lower than coal prices. It's, um, it's been amazing, except the last few weeks, anyone who's been watching the news in Queensland, we've had a, a generator went down up in Gladstone and it's, um, it's really played havoc in, uh, in the wholesale electricity market. But that's again, that's why our conservative view in derivatives and hedging, we're hedged out um, quite a way, so it won't affect us at all. Okay. And what are the components of the cost base below uh, gross profit? And, you know, what's kind of fixed in nature there and what's kind of uh, variable? Yeah, so a big part of it is um, employee costs. So we've got 75 staff now, and that, you know, that includes our sales, our customer care team, um, billing teams. So yeah, that's, that's a, that's the majority of our costs and, and something again, we've, we're trying to, or we're trying, we've been successful at increasing efficiencies and it's always something we're monitoring. So that's the lion's share. The, the, the bigger items outside of that are, are billing, um, you know, uh, servicing bills. And so, um, yeah, they're, they're our big costs that we're, we're keeping on top of that. We're confident that the good thing with uh, with technology too, and, and we're about to to roll out a, a heap of technology for our customers, is we believe we can scale with the size. You know, we're not going to have to scale our staff in linear to the numbers of customers that we put on. So we could we can definitely handle another ten to fifteen thousand customers with uh, with the, the more or less the, the team we have. Okay, and then. Uh, yeah, we, I think we can squeeze one more in just before we get through time. Um, who is the strategic partner you previously mentioned as selling the Sol Share solution along the East Coast? I'm not sure I've mentioned anyone. Um, okay. Yeah, like we base so LPE has exclusive rights to 
to install, sell the, uh, the sole share in Queensland and, and New South Wales. So um, yeah, that's um, okay. not sure what that, not sure about that question. Okay, no worries. We're up on time anyway. So the short answer actually worked uh, perfectly. Um, Justin, thank you very much for uh, joining us from Mar Maruchidor this morning. If you could stop sharing your screen, as yep. I know Chris is waiting for us down in Bendigo, and we'll just get Chris to start sharing his screen now. Just waiting for Chris, it's coming through now. Uh, I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Chris, so you're ready to go. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Mark, and thanks for the opportunity to, um, to talk uh, and give an update on APM Animal Health. So um, APM is uh, a company where the only uh, veterinary uh, company that's listed on the ASX currently, um, we listed in 2015. Um, as I said, we're a veterinary business. We, we've got a very diversified and robust uh, business model with our veterinary clinics being located in um, rural and regional Australia. So, uh, and that, that enables us to provide uh, services across a whole spectrum of production animals or farm animals, as well as uh, what we call, call companion animals being cats and dogs. Um, in addition to veterinary services, we're also vertically integrated across the uh, entire animal health chain. And, and what I mean by that is that we also have our own uh, vaccine company that supplies products uh, in across our customer base. Uh, we have our own warehousing and logistics um, businesses to, um, to supply those products directly onto uh, the farms that we service. We have uh, 59 uh, clinic locations or business locations, um, predominantly across the Eastern States we, uh, in, uh, in the uh, fast growing regional locations. We do have uh, a clinic in Western Australia that um, provides services into the uh, pig and poultry industry uh, over there. Uh, the company is currently um, successfully executing a, a regional expansion strategy. Uh, we're doing this um, in addition to our organic strategy, we're doing it uh, with uh, acquisitions and, uh, and a Greenfield Clinic rollout program. Uh, there's strong industry uh, outlook for, um, for the regional and rural veterinary markets. Um, you're probably aware that there's, that there's uh, a movement, a population movement from the cities out into the regional areas uh, following um, the uh, impact of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, and, uh, and then since the easing of the drought last year, we're seeing increases in, uh, in the farming industries and the number of animals, uh, particularly uh, on pasture. Um, APM provides an attractive financial uh, profile uh, with reported revenue growth, uh, earnings margin expansion. We've got strong operating cash flows and, and we've been paying uh, dividends over the last five years. If we have a, a quick look at uh, from an ASX dashboard point of view, uh, our share price has had considerable growth um, over the last 12 months. Over the last six months, it's up about 45%. Um, and we have a market cap of uh, around $126 million. Uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the registry, 28% uh, of shares are owned by uh, board and management. Um, employees also own a um, significant amount of shares and our joint venture partner, um, Petstock, uh, also own 16.4%. Um, if I talk a bit more about the, the business in itself and, um, and, and what it looks like, we have our core veterinary business, uh, providing veterinary services, and as I said, across a, a whole range of different species. Um, and those clinics are all 100% um, uh, owned. Uh, we also have a joint venture with uh, Petstock where we, we currently have uh, three clinics that we've um, co-located with their, um, their retail stores. And, uh, and we have a over 200 veterinarians and, uh, and technicians that are providing these services, um, as well as uh, providing products, uh, so which make up about 65% of our revenue. 
Uh, we have an extensive range of animal health products. Um, we have exclusive product distribution. We've developed a private label range and uh, we also manufacture autogenous vaccines. Our, our farmers are using um, online platform to order these products and they're being delivered uh, direct uh, through our warehousing and logistics systems to their, to their farms. In addition to our core veterinary business, uh, we have some other complementary uh, businesses that uh, add further value to our, to our client base. Uh, we've got uh, genetic services as well as providing um, what's becoming more important in the, in the farming industry and in the production of food around quality assurance services. Uh, we have a, a veterinary diagnostic laboratory that also um, has, offers parasitology and feed testing and, uh, and also manufactures vaccines that we can um, supply across our, our customer base. A uh, majority of our business is based in Australia. Prior to um, the COVID, we were providing a small amount of veterinary consultancy services into other countries, mainly in the feedlot and the genetic side. We do have a, a joint venture with a, a large uh, veterinary group in, uh, in the US um, to provide um, specialised uh, swine products into that market. Um, and um, our vaccine facility, which is based in Bendigo in Victoria, has also um, commenced exporting into um, some other markets, predominantly uh, into New Zealand. So that's really an overview, an overview of the business, just uh, adding a little bit more to our, our operations. Um, we, as I said, we've got 59 um, clinics. Um, we uh, added on eight this year. Um, some of those are acquisitions, uh, some of them are greenfields. Um, we have a, a number of programs to invest in our, in our people and, and develop our people, which is really critical in professional services. So we have a leadership program. We've got 45 mental health first aid officers that are located in, in um, 45 uh, of our clinics and um, to support our people. Um, if we look at uh, what sort of changing in, in our business is that our, the component of our business, uh, the revenue that's contributed to uh, companion animals and other, other mixed animals is increasing rapidly and it's now over 50% of our, our revenue contribution. That's being driven by the, the increase in animal numbers, but also the, the increase and in, in the growth in our service program. So Best Mates program, which I'll talk to a bit more, where um, we reported at the half um, of FY21, we'd had 40% growth. That's now up over um, over 100% um, on the prior year, on a, on a year-to-date basis. We've got about 5,000 um, members signed up to our Best Mates program, which is our subscription program. Having a quick look at, uh, at our financials over the last three years, um, we've been able to continue to get um, resilient revenue growth um, despite challenging industries that have, uh, can, or challenging industry conditions that have occurred in some of our agricultural areas, particularly in, in, uh, in the pig and feedlot side, um, which are at different parts of their cycle. Um, but our investment in systems and our targeted change in our business mix, particularly around uh, reducing our exposure to low margin wholesale business and focusing more on higher value products and services is driving um, strong gross margin improvement across the business. Uh, just a, a quick uh, summary of our of our reported results and at uh, at the half of FY21, we you can see that we we've had growth in revenue, um, higher growth at a gross uh, a gross profit level um, as a result of that that change in business mix, and uh, and that's starting to fall through um, to the bottom line. We uh, as I said we pay a dividend and we uh, increased our dividend um, at the first half compared to um, the previous comparative period. So what I'd like to talk a bit more about today is just um, how we're going to be capturing growth through this uh, regional expansion um, program. So if we look at the regional veterinary markets, they're growing very strongly um, and there's certainly an attractive market opportunity there um, for us. Um, population rates are surging in, in regional growth corridors, um, anywhere sort of within um, a couple of hundred kilometres of, um, of capital cities, we're seeing increase in, um, in population growth um, not just through housing development, but also through um, increase in um, small farming operations and, and hobby farms. Um, we're seeing significant increase in, in pet ownership post COVID and the reported numbers um, have been around 20 to 30% increase in, in pet ownership. Um, and that's not just um, 
confined to the cities, we're seeing that in the regional areas as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, since the drought uh, broke in most of our regions, um, there's been continued growth in, um, in the livestock um, industry in terms of the, the number of animals and the, uh, and the requirement for veterinary services for those animals. Uh, APM's got a, a large and, and a broad animal experience um, required for a regional vet offering. And, and what I mean there is that, you know, when we start to get into these regional areas, um, veterinary services have to be able to offer not just services to companion animal, but they've got to have that expertise and the equipment required um, and the other systems required to be able to service um, the production animals. And so APM uh, has, that, um, has that offering, which is different to, um, you know, metro focused um, veterinary models. Uh, what we're seeing in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the market and, and in our business is, you know, mixed animal veterinary clinics, um, they generally offer a higher margin opportunities than our livestock only clinics. Um, we've got a lot more growth and, and we're acquiring those types of clinics and that's what's also contributing to our um, gross margin um, expansion. So, you know, there's some reported numbers out there about what, what growth looking like in vet clinics. Um, the AMA reported um, recently based on some 2019 numbers that the spend of vet clinics has, has grown 19% in three years. Um, since COVID, that's been uh, a lot uh, higher growth rate than that. Um, and, and those results will get reported um, probably in the next six to 12 months. But um, from our regional you know, expansion strategy, it's, um, it's on, uh, on track to, to capture this uh, rapid veterinary um, market growth. And I was talking a bit about why we're, you know, why we're set up to, to do that. And so if you look at our strategic framework for growth, over the last uh, three or four years, we've been investing significantly in our capacity and, and our processes to make sure that we've got good systems in place. And uh, we've also been investing in uh, new product development and uh, development of new services, um, again, that we can now um, roll out um, across our existing animals, but also we can, uh, we can, if we can increase, uh, um, increase the number of animals that we service and, and, uh, and leverage the investments that we've made across these, uh, these animals. So the way that we, intend to drive uh, growth in terms of animal numbers going forward is, you know, through a greenfield clinic strategy uh, in attractive growth corridors, through an ongoing acquisition program, and then also through leveraging our service programs um, across these um, animal numbers and, and using those programs to actually attract more, more animal numbers to APM. So I'll just go through uh, those different, uh, different areas of, of how we're increasing animal numbers. So with the greenfields, um, our greenfield clinics are really focusing on, on um, the expansion in high population and, and peri-urban growth corridors. So we've rolled out um, some of the, you know, three of these over the last um, few years. Um, they're rolled out under the Furlife Vet brand. Um, they've got strong revenue and margin opportunities and, and we've successfully been able to roll them, roll them out. What's different uh, to these clinics compared to what might be built in the city is they're a lot larger. So we build them large enough so that they'll um, support six to 10 vets, that they're gonna you know, be three to six million in revenue. Um, there's, there's certainly a, a bit of a drag at uh, an EBIT level uh, in the first 12 months. So you, each clinic usually um, has, a, has an effect of about $250,000 in, in, uh, in the first year on, on EBIT, but then they, they break even uh, in the second year and then are at full maturity in the third year. And, um, the return on capital over a five-year period, um, you know, we're expecting to get um, over 30%. In terms of what we've been doing in FY21, um, we've, we've rolled out two of these clinics, um, one at Torquay North, which is a co-located clinic with pet stock um, in that fast-growing Geelong region, and then we've opened another one at uh, Shepparton uh, in Victoria. So we've got further clinics planned. We've got another one that's opening in Geelong in about three weeks time. Um, so part of that, part of those green fields um, we're doing as part of a, a joint venture that we formed with uh, Petstock in 2018, um, where we um, co-locate clinics um, with their regional outlets. So in terms of choosing those optimal locations, um, we're really looking for peri-urban locations with strong, you know, a strong track record of of population growth. So we also, we already, they need to have population growth there already and, and, and a population base, but then also, um, 
uh, a very um, strong prospect of continued population growth. Um, and so if you look at, for example, Torquay North, um, we're getting most of our business from those, those new developments um, um, coming down to, to that clinic. So other, other metrics that look at what, you know, where we put them, well, you know, I said within a couple of hundred uh, kilometres or, you know, um, an hour and a half to two hours of a capital city, that's because people are now um, more, you know, working from home for two or three days a week and then travelling into the city. So they're living out there in the country. Uh, we like to see a species mix. Some will be companion animal only, but uh, a number of them uh, will also be, uh, you know, be able to service horses and, and cattle and, and other other production animals. Uh, we're building them in regions where we can uh, leverage our existing um, infrastructure and, um, and support services. And uh, we're also building them in uh, large regional cities where um, we can really build out uh, new regions. In terms of uh, acquisitions, um, that's also part of our, our growth strategy to increase our animal numbers. Uh, we've got a strong acquisition pipeline um, for strategic investments. We, we're a company that, that do take a very um, disciplined approach to uh, acquisitions. Uh, we've got a strict acquisition criteria. Uh, we've made 11 acquisitions in the past three years, consisting of 15 clinics and, and a laboratory, um, and uh, really leveraging the, the infrastructure that, uh, that we've built. When it comes to those criteria, um, there's really five, five things that we, that we really look at. One is they, they need to be able to expand a region, our regional footprint, bring more animals to us. Um, they need to have an attractive animal exposure, meaning that we want to you know, have you know, maybe at least 50% uh, on the companion, companion animal side and uh, an ability for growth. They need to be, um, have strong financial metrics. Um, they need to be large enough for the ability, you know, for the ability to expand. And, um, and probably the most important thing for us is that they need to have a, an excellent team, good culture and, and proven um, track record so that we uh, have confidence that they'll be able to realize the synergies and deliver the, the growth that, uh, that we're expecting. So uh, this is an example of some um, of acquisitions that we announced a couple of weeks ago. So uh, this is where we acquired three, three businesses consisting of four clinics in, in Queensland. Um, which will add about 10 million of revenue on, a, on an FY21 pro forma basis. So the, the first clinic, Sanford Valley, this is a, a large clinic that, that's probably the, you know, the, the closest one we bought to a capital city. So it's 25 kilometres um, northwest of Brisbane. Uh, when it was founded um, 50 years ago, it was predominantly production animals, but it's now grown to a clinic that's between 65, 70% companion animals. Um, really following that strong peri-urban um, growth that's occurring. So that clinic, uh, you know, continues to provide services into um, the equine industry as well as, as well as cattle. So it fits um, perfectly for the, you know, for us um, to be able to capitalize on, on that clinic. Um, and again, it, it's, it's sort of not that um, type of clinic that one of the large um, companion animal groups are likely to, to look for. So we settled that on June the 1st. Claremont, Claremont's interesting, that is in um, central Queensland. Um, again, it's got good revenue split across uh, companion animal equine and cattle fairly, fairly equally. Um, and uh, that's a clinic that um, we're, we're seeing as a, as a centerpiece to build out an additional region. That, that clinic currently services a, a, a geographical um, sort of um, area about the size of Tasmania, but it, uh, it's, a, it's a core clinic for us with uh, some specialist um, skill sets that will enable us to build out that region. And then Knox Veterinary, um, which consists of two clinics in Dolby and, and Tara, um, it sits uh, in a region where we have two other um, existing, existing clinics so that um, we can expand our services through the Darling Downs region and, and leverage the existing investments that we've got in there. So that's sort of uh, what we're doing in terms of uh, acquisitions. In terms of um, organic growth in the production animals, um, we're uh, rolling out new vaccines um, across the, the cattle and, and the pig industry. In the dairy industry, we launched a, a, um, a program a couple of years ago uh, called Pro Dairy, which is an end-to-end -end product and service model for dairy farmers. Uh, it, this year to date, we've had 100% growth in terms of our dairy farm enrolments. We've got 
about 12% of Victoria's dairy cows enrolled in the program. Um, Victoria uh, has about 70% of the, of the Australia's dairy industry. And we're also been expanding that out through um, Tasmania and Southern New South Wales. So we've got a fairly aggressive strategy at the moment uh, in, in, that, uh, in that market to really increase our market penetration into other geographical areas. And that includes um, setting up two satellite clinics um, to really uh, give us a, a, a footprint in some new regions. Our Best Mates program is a, a whole of life companion animal wellness program. We, we commenced the rollout of that at the start of FY20. And uh, we've seen very strong growth uh, reflective of increased pet ownership um, post COVID-19 um, lockdowns. So um, again, uh, this is a program that when we, um, we make acquisitions or we build greenfield uh, clinics, uh, we, can, we can roll that straight into those, uh, into those clinics. Our two greenfield clinics that we've recently opened, um, their uh, membership of active clients is sitting at around 25%. So it's a program that certainly um, has got good uptake in, uh, in, in new clinics. And currently we've got about 6.8% uh, of our active patients across the, across the business um, that are members. Um, but we, you know, that, that leaves a, still a fair bit of growth opportunity there. We think it may be, maybe cap out around 20, 25%. So if we uh, look at um, outlook for the company, so we've got regional veterinary markets are growing very strongly. Um, our management team are, are very focused on, um, on growth um, through regional expansion, you know, greenfield clinics, um, acquisitions, but also through our um, organic uh, business initiatives. Um, and then our business reinvestment, um, it's very carefully balanced against return on capital thresholds. So with Greenfield Clinics, um, you know, we know that uh, we're gonna have some initial initial downside at a, uh, at a, at a uh, EBIT level, but we know we get very good return on capital um, over a longer period. Um, with our acquisitions, we know we get immediate uh, um, cash flows uh, and the opportunity to uh, improve um, our returns on capital in those businesses. So with that, um, Mark, I'll uh, open it up to any questions. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, just uh, first one after, in terms of deciding between um, an acquisition and a, and a greenfield site, I'm thinking now, you know, you mentioned Shepparton there as a, as a greenfield one. If we take maybe, you know, somewhere like Orange in New South Wales, where, you know, it's a decent sized town, probably the same size as Shepparton or maybe slightly smaller. But, you know, I'm sure has an existing vet um, clinic uh, in town servicing, you know, the, the local market. You know, what makes you decide we'd like to try and acquire that one? Or we think actually we're better off putting in a greenfields one and we'll just compete with this clinic just just more about that decision where you've got an existing clinic uh, and trying to decide do we acquire it or we can put in our, our own greenfields one and just compete with them yeah i mean our, our preference for example in somewhere like orange or those large regional cities is to acquire an existing clinic because they there tends to be a large dominant clinic in town that might have six to six to ten vets so you know, in that case, our preference would be to acquire. Now, in the event that we couldn't acquire, um, we we would then consider Greenfield, but it would have to meet. You know, um, you know, we'd have to be fairly sure that um, that we were able to uh, attract uh, you know a similar level of skill set to that region in our clinics, and that um, and that there was going to be um, you know some real uh, additional growth to what was uh, to what historically had been happening in that region. So. You know, we're not. I so say we're not just going to go and build a greenfield clinic because we can't buy one because uh, if, if, unless it's going to make sense and it's going to meet the financial metrics that we expect it to to meet. Um, whereas, you know, in Torquay, for example, that was a that was an example of where we did quite, uh, try to acquire um, in that region and um, we were unsuccessful. But um, when you look at the the growth that's occurring in that region, and if we position the the clinic in the right uh, the right place then we're expecting to get exceptional growth and we also um, knew that there was um, you know strong demand from experienced vets to come and um, operate a brand new state-of-the-art clinic so it, it made it ticked all the boxes for us in in that case 
Great. And then we go on here from the audience. Um, what's the margin uplift per customer um, when they transition from, you know, a pure transactional um, mm. fee for service versus um, coming on to the, the best mates program? Yeah, so it, it varies. Uh, it does vary across the, um, each clinic, um, depending upon um, the level of services that they provide and um, and um, and how active the clinic is in promoting the best mates program. But to give you, you know, on average, um, someone who is uh, not on the program might spend around about four hundred and fifty dollars a year. Um, those that are on the best mates program, which um, uh, costs about five hundred and fifty dollars annual subscription, um, for which they get a lot of services uh, and they get unlimited access in terms of consults. They tend to spend on average around eleven hundred dollars um, annually on their animal. Okay, great. And then, in terms of um, the mix going forward, do you have a a preference of you know you'd like it to be fifty fifty greenfields? versus acquisition or are you agnostic to you know what comes through the pipeline you know i'm just saying you know next year could be very acquisition heavy the following year maybe very greenfields heavy um what's our kind of um outlook on that no it'll, it'll definitely be a lot larger on the acquisition side so you know we've got a very strong uh, pipeline of acquisitions and um greenfields you know, would really, really just come in where, um, you know, where we can't do acquisitions and um, and, and say that, that it fits the right um, financial metrics for us. So, you know, we, we might continue to do two or three greenfields a year, but, um, you know, we'd expect um, a lot more than that in terms of acquisitions. Okay, great. Okay, I'm just going to check, Chris, if we got any further questions. Coming through here from the audience, I'll just give it a second. And then in terms of, I guess, vet availability, um, has that been impacted by, you know, the travel ban and, and immigration? Or is there enough kind of graduates, you know, coming through the, the domestic um, veterinary schools to kind of meet uh, demand in locations that require vets? No, there's definitely a, a vet short, shortfall across the industry at the moment. It's been been well reported that there's probably uh, the industry as a whole has uh, probably a shortfall of about 800 vets. So there's no doubt that um, that, that that's occurring. To, uh, some of that is occurring because of the uh, until recently the inability to really bring vets in from overseas. So a few weeks ago, the government added vets to the um, the PMSOL, which is basically the priority migration scheme so that now vets have a priority that we that can uh, um, in terms of their visa applications and get them in so that that'll certainly provide um, a a little bit of uh, relief in terms of you know from a short-term point of view but um, there certainly needs to be development of uh, of more vets uh, coming into um, coming into the industry um, particularly as we see a, you know, a transition to a number of vets wanting to work um, part-time and, and, and different work arrangements. So, you know, we, we've been um, very active in this space to, um, to recruit vets and retain vets. We've been changing the way that we've been operating our, our veterinary business and our veterinary services. So we've implemented a, uh, a vet triage um, service. It's a, it's a virtual vet triage service for after hours. So unlike in the city where... Um, most vets would uh, finish at the end of the day and then animals get referred to um, emergency centres. Uh, in, the, in the rural and regional areas, we have to do all our own uh, after hours on, you know, at, during weekdays and on weekends. So what we've implemented is a virtual triage service. Uh, we've got um, experienced vet nurses located around the country. They take all the calls from the clinics and, um, and what they've been able to do is reduce the number of calls that need to go to vets um, by over 50%. So that's improving the work-life balance of our, of our vets. And we see that as a, a real attractive part of our um, employment value proposition or employee value proposition um, to be able to um, attract uh, more vets to, to APM. So yeah, there, there's certainly a vet shortage, but I think we're doing, we're doing um, 
um, a pretty good job in most regions um, at being able to meet the, the demands that are out there. Yeah, great. Chris, we're just coming up on 10 a.m. now, so I think we'll we, we leave it there. Thanks for coming back in, in again and, and giving us an update on all things APM, and we'll watch out for the, the full year result in uh, a couple of weeks' time. No worries. Thanks for um, being part of it. Okay, thank you, everybody. And as I said, recording will be up on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning. I wish everybody a good rest of their Thursday.